They were on with Dr. Hart a little earlier. And of course, I am Pastor Ariel Davis of the Corinth Baptist Church in the Chapel Hill area of the city of Tyler, Texas. We welcome our Facebook family and all of those who are on the prayer line. Amen. Okay. Trust on this second Sunday in uh, July that you are faring well with the hot weather here in Texas and with the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, I'm blessed to announce that so far as I am aware, uh, none of our membership has been directly affected by the, by the virus. I trust that my information is correct. Amen. It is a blessing. We do not consider ourselves special. We just thank God and we pray to him. We do what we can by practicing social distancing, by wearing our masks and good hygiene. And that's what we can do. And then we leave the rest to God who is able to do anything but fail. God knows how to take care of us. Amen. And now we are, we are going to prepare our message for today. We ask you to look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. COVID-19 items like a test kit or a mask. Isaiah 59. I want to focus on verses 1 and 2. Now, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, but we're going to talk about Chapter 58, but we'll read for your hearing verses 1 and 2 of chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59. It reads, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Amen. So read the word of God. The grass withereth and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. From this text, we want to talk from the subject of trying to serve two masters. Mm. Trying to serve two masters. Right. And that's God and sin. Serving God while holding on to our sin. Sound like something we are doing today. Amen. Amen. In, in, in chapter 58, uh, the Lord is acknowledging that the people, his people, Israel, was seeking him daily and were delighted to know his ways. This is verse 2 as a nation, and did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delight in approaching to God. He said they fasted like they were supposed to fast, but as a result of that, it appeared that God was not responding to them as if he did not hear them, nor was he delivering them from their perils. And they were wondering why God was not answering them. Has something happened to God that is hands had become too short, they could not reach them where they were and deliver them out of their circumstances? Has something happened to God that his ears were stopped up 
and he could not hear their cry? That appeared to be the question ringing in the minds of the Israelites. And God answers it in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, through his prophet Isaiah. Isaiah told them, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot deliver you no matter what your circumstances are, no matter where you are, no matter how powerful the enemy might be who's pressing against you, the Lord can reach you wherever you are, and he still has the power to deliver you. Amen. To answer the question, does the Lord hear our cry? Is he hearing us? He said, yes, the Lord hear. Nothing has happened to it. He still can hear. It's not so heavy. It's not blocked that he cannot hear your cry. So he can deliver. His arms are still long enough. His ears are still clear enough. But the reason he is not delivering you and the reason he is not responding to you is because of your sins. Yes, you're crying unto him. Yes, you're going to church like you uh, ought to go. Yes, you're serving in capacities in the church. Yes, you're doing all of these things. You are sharing your talent and your time and your treasure. You're doing all of that, but at the same time, you're holding on to your sin. And the fact that you're doing these things are blocked out by the fact that you are still holding on to your sins. The question, the question is, why were they, why were they holding on to their sins? Why were they? There are a couple of reasons why. Number one, the things that they were doing and saying or not doing they did not recognize as being sin. Sometimes you can do stuff that's wrong so long until it appears right. Sometimes the things you do does not appear wrong because, quote, everybody else is doing it. God does not set his rules and agenda based on what other folk are doing God is sovereign, he knows what's right, and he sets his agenda, his rules based on righteousness. So whether we recognize it as sin or not, in God's eye, like in the eyes of the law, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So sometimes we have been so caught up in our sin and been so involved in it until it just does not appear to us to be wrong anymore. It doesn't seem to be hurting anybody. So why is it so wrong? And anyway, it looked like God take all of the pleasurable things in life that give us joy and pleasure and a sense of well-being, and he put a, a label of sin on it. And he does that, it looked like it takes away all of the joy out of our lives. So they were holding on to their sin. They gave up some sins, and sometimes those of you in the church today, you have given up a lot of sin. But there are some sins you still hold on to. And you're trying to serve God and that sin. And the Bible has declared that you cannot serve two masters. No matter how skillful you are, no matter how much you love the Lord and love sin, you cannot serve two masters. So one of the reasons why they hold on to their sins is they don't recognize it as being sin because everybody's doing it. And I've been doing it so long that it doesn't seem wrong in my sight. The second reason that we may not uh, 
uh, want to hold on to our sin is because we think in our heart that we can live over our sin. We know it's a sin, but we can live over our sin. And we do that by trying to put on the new man without pulling off the old man. Ah, we, 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 we feel like that I can do right. I can do all the things I'm supposed to do as a new man and still have the old man under there. The Bible says you cannot do that. You cannot put new wine in old wine skins. You got to make a choice between God and your sin. The Bible says that we need to pull off the old man first and then put on the new man. But that means get rid of all the sin and get rid of all the evil and iniquity and then take on in this place the righteousness of God. Ah, but there are some of us, some of you, who want to put the old man on. It's just like taking, coming out of the field of work all dirty and sweaty and what have you, keeping your old dirty clothes on and putting new clothes on top of them and go out as if everything is all right. If you do that, those old clothes and dirt is going to come out <laughs> through the new clothes and folk will still know you're dirty. Right. So some are trying to put on the new man. They want to do what's right. Amen. But they... They're having trouble giving up uh, some of the sin. Now, there's some sin we don't have any problem giving up. There's some we don't uh, see that's so wrong and bad in it. But but there's some that we just, not we, some, some of y'all have trouble giving up some of the sin. You hold them close to your heart. And you want to put on the new man over it. And that's why you hold on to your sin. Another reason why they say that uh, we hold on to our sin is that we are doing what is right, what God requires of us, but we're doing it for the wrong reason. We've got an ulterior motives for doing it. I'm, I'm a One preacher friend of mine said that uh, when he was Younger days, he went to church every Sunday, and he participated in all the church's activities. But it wasn't because he was so interested in the Bible and church. He was interested in a little girl that was also there at church, and he was doing what he could to impress her rather than God. He was doing what he should have been doing, but he was doing it for the wrong reason, and I believe that's the case in a lot of brothers out there got caught by the Lord while we were there looking at somebody else. So they were doing what they were doing, receiving the praises of men, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. They were doing it for to be received the praises and the honor and the recognition of that fellow man. And the Lord said, when you do that for that reason, you have your reward from those you're trying to impress but you do not receive a reward from him. So those are some of the reasons why we try to hold on to our sins while we serve God. But then there are some other reasons. Because sin is a terrible thing. It, 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 it's just terrible. God hates it. It's, it's a stench in God's nostrils. And uh, it's a terrible thing, but we still hold on to our sin. It's an old problem that, that, that plagues us. It has plagued us from the beginning of time since Adam and Eve. And it's still plaguing us now. David suffered from the sin. And the same sin that trapped David is trapping men right today. So sin is a terrible problem. But why don't we, what are some of the other reasons that we hold on to our sin? What, well, it'd be number one, 
We actually love sin. We, we don't hate sin. We love sin. We like it. We know it. We're familiar with it. We grew up with it. Sin has been a part of our lives ever since we were children. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So we know sin. We're familiar with sin. We grew up with sin. We're comfortable with sin. We saw everybody doing some kind of sin. So because of that, we think sin is not all of that, that bad. Especially when we do it. Now, now when, when, when we see somebody else doing it, and we see somebody else failing to live up to God's righteousness, we think that's horrible, that's, that's terrible, that's a disgrace, that's, as we say, that's a sin and a shame. But when we are doing it, we say, really, listen, it's not really all that bad. After all, I'm just human. So it doesn't seem so bad when we're doing it, but it's a horrible thing when I see somebody else do it. And that's because we love sin. We know it. We're familiar with it. We've been a part of our lives, all of our lives. And I got news for you. It's going to be a part of your life until God takes us out of this world. Because sin is all in our members. And when God saved you from the consequences of the penalty of your sin, he did not take the sin nature out. He left it there. He did put the Holy Ghost in to help us to deal with it. But he did not remove it. So you are going to be troubled by sin the rest of your life. We love it. Another reason why we love sin is sin makes us feel good. Well, now, I really don't know about this, but my brother told me that, that when he was out there sinning, he enjoyed his sin. And he couldn't see nothing wrong with his sin. And there were folk who came out in the world uh, to try to get him out, and they joined him. And, and then they said, well, now it's time for us to quit this. And he said, well, listen, if that's why you came out here with me to get me to change. You're wasting your time. I love what I'm doing. It makes me feel good. You know, if sin didn't make you feel good, you wouldn't do it. So sin is enjoyable. Sin is pleasurable. Sin gives us a sense of being somebody. Sin gives us a sense of uh, accomplishing something that some folk cannot do. You know, the Bible says stolen waters is sweet. Sin tastes good in our mouth. It makes us feel Good. It's another reason why we hold on to it. Sin feels good, makes us feel good. We know it. We're familiar with it. And then it helps to, third, it helps to address a deep craving in our soul. There's something in us that we seek to satisfy. There's a craving to fulfill a desire in our spirit. And we try to fill it with things that are displeasing in the sight of God. Some try drugs, some try sex, some try power, some try education. But this void can only be filled by God. But we try to substitute other things to fulfill this deep craving that we have inside of us for something that's outside of us. So sin helps and tries to address that, never being successful in doing it. But yet it causes us to love sin because it tries to address this deep craving that all of us have that can only be filled by God. Then another reason why we love and hang on to sin is because sin's chief promoter never gives up on us. That's the devil. He, he never gives us. He always tried to flash opportunities before us in order for us to engage in his business of sin. We don't, sometimes you don't have to look for sin. 
Sin come right and uh -huh. look you dead in the eye. You don't have to look for opportunity to sin. Opportunity prayed itself in front of you. All you got to do is reach out and take it. So sin's promoter never gives up on us. Sin's promoter keep flashing what he knows we like in front of us to encourage us to participate in it. Now, if the promoter of sin knows you don't like drugs, he's going to not try to pray no drugs in front of you. He parades stuff in front of you that he knows you are, you are, you love, that you have a weakness for, that you can be tempted by. And that boy, Satan, never gives up on us, and he's always on his job 24-7. He'll wake you up in the middle of the night and give you ideas about sinning. He'll wake you up from your deep, sweet sleep in order to offer you an opportunity to sin. So these are reasons why we hold on to our sin. Why, why should we give it up? Why should we give it up? First of all, it displeases God. And whatever displeases God, we ought to be willing to give up. If it causes God to not deliver us when we're in our peril, if it causes God not to hear us when we cry unto him, we ought to give it up. We should not allow anything to come between us and God because God can be a great benefit to us in this life that we're living in today and God is the only one who can carry us over to the other side. So Amen. there are reasons why. Number one, it offends God. Second of all, sin hurts us. Yes, it feels good in the mouth, but it sours when it gets to the belly. Sometimes when you engage, I heard when you engage in your sin, you enjoy it as soon as it's over, you wish you hadn't done it. So sin hurts. It hurts us. It hurts our sense of dignity to ourselves, and it hurts somebody else, especially if there's somebody else that the sin is causing to lose confidence in us. So sin hurts us, and sin hurts others. Then sin, I understand and I heard, that it causes us to take enormous risks of our lives, of our well-being, of our family. It causes us to take risks that a normal, sane person would not take. We take great risks, put so much at stake for such little gain, and the gain that we receive is only temporary. Sin does not last, no matter how enjoyable it is, 10 minutes after you finish sinning, you can't tell you have sin. There's no lasting benefit in it. But yet sin causes us to put everything on the line in order to delve in it. Our life, our reputation, our families, our job, our good standing in the community, and most of all, our relationship with God. So sin is hurtful. It hurts us. It displeases God. Causes us to take great risk, and then it causes us regret. I understand, not that I know about it personally, but there are those who tell me that they think back over their lives and look at some of the sin they committed and the people they hurt, and they regret to the utmost that they were so ignorant, so stupid that they engaged in that sin and thought they were having a good time. So sin causes great regret to us when God opens our eyes, when we give God our lives, and he opens our eyes, we can look back over it during our time of blindness and see the stupidity that we exhibited when we call ourselves having a good time call ourselves being somebody, call ourselves being the person of the hour, call ourselves being on top of the world. Sin causes 
regret. Well, also, sometimes we, 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 we sin because we say, well, yes, I sin, but God forgives. Yes, that is right. God does forgive. And I don't care what the sin is. I don't care how long you have been engaging in it. When you are willing to repent of it, turn your face from it, change your mind about it, and turn to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, God forgives. But when he forgives you, he does not reverse or erase the damage that the sin caused. For instance, in your rage of anger, you kill somebody. Yes, that's a sin. The Bible said, thou shalt not kill. You murder somebody. You can cry out to God and God will forgive you for that. But the person you shot and killed are still dead. God does not reverse that action. The family of the person that you kill still will be suffering from that the rest of their lives. If they had children, they'll grow up without their father. And that will never be changed. God forgives you, but he does not reverse the damage that was caused during your sin. So that's a good reason why we should not sin. Yes, God is faithful to forgive us, but he doesn't change what happened. Lord have mercy. He does not change what happened. So that's enough for us to forgive. And then, not only does God not change the result, there is no such thing as free sin. You're going to pay for your sin. Even if God forgives you. And if you had a seed in the kingdom, he gives you a seed in the kingdom. If you already had one, he'll forgive you and allow you to keep your seed in the kingdom. But you're going to have to pay for your sin. Now, a man who was after God's own heart was named David. David committed a horrendous sin. He walked out on the balcony one day and saw something he couldn't handle. He saw a beautiful lady bathing, and he sent for her. And she came, and they got together, and she became with child. And then David sought to pin the child on her husband. But that didn't work. Then David had a husband killed, and then brought the woman into his own home and married her. He did that. That displeased God. That hurt Uriah's family, killed him. It hurt David's image in the sight of those who were aware of what's happened. God forgave him, but then David had to pay for it. Yes, the child died. David had to pay for it. Yes, he had trouble in his family. One of his sons raped his daughter. Yes, David had to pay for it. Another son rose up and killed the son that raped his daughter. Yes, David had to pay for it. Another son rose up and turned against David and tried to run him off the throne. And David had to run and hide from his own son. Yes, David had to pay for it. It does not matter who you are. And David was the man after God's own heart. But he had to pay for his sin. Yes, sin displeases God. Yes, God will forgive us for our sin. But God does not reverse the damage that has been done. And you're going to have to pay for your sin. You cannot serve sin and God. God does not allow himself to compete with anybody. He's God all by himself. So God will not tolerate being in competition with anybody for our souls. But God is loving. God is forgiving. And God is caring. And God is plenteous in mercy and grace. When he was when you were sinning and God held his hand over you. It was not because he was endorsing your sin. 
It's not because he was going along with your sin. It's not because he was too weak to stop you from your sin. He was giving you time to come to yourself. So you can realize how foolish that you were. Realize that sin is not fulfilling. That sin is not uh, what it, it appears to be. That our only hope for what we're looking for in this life. Our only hope for joy. Our only hope for peace. Our only hope for security. Our only hope for prosperity without problem. Can only come from God. If you serve him, if you give your life to him, if you turn your back on Satan who's always offering us opportunity to sin, if we turn our back on it, I tell you, I heard that when you reject sin, what a wonderful feeling that you get realizing Amen. that God has given you the power to resist that which at one time you were too weak to resist. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. He is so faithful and just. He understands our condition. He knows we are but flesh. He knows there's no good thing in us. But he creates the opportunity for our soul and our spirit to be saved and encased in him. So that he cannot sin. So he can be delivered to him when this life is over. So no matter how skillful you are, you cannot serve two masters. You've got to make a choice. Between God and sin. You got to make a choice. The fork of the road is always there. The devil's on one side saying choose sin. Live now. Because you don't know what tomorrow will hold. On the other hand God says choose God. Serve God. Because you don't know what the future holds. But I am the one who holds the future. And if you're in my hand everything is alright. Yes. You may suffer, you may have trials, you may have tribulation, but as long as you're in my hands, everything's going to be all right. You may go through the valley of the shadow of death, but you don't have to fear big. When I am with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I tell you, when you, sin, when you get in trouble from sin, the devil's not going to come to your rescue, but God will come when you call him and turn from your sin. So today, the Lord wants us to know that we cannot effectively serve two masters. We cannot serve sin, which makes us dirty, and try to put Christ on, who is the new man and clean, and it won't work because the old man stench will come through. We have a veneer that looks good, but the smell of the old man will come through and folk will know that we are not a child of God. So today, make up your mind to serve God. Turn your back on sin. And when you do, oh, what a wonderful feeling you will have knowing that God has given you the power to resist that which at one time you had no power to resist. You will be more than conqueror with Christ. And not only will he help you in this life, give you joy and peace and a sense of well-being even in the midst of disaster, in the midst of the coronavirus, in the midst of a government that is not uh, responsive to your needs, in the midst of crime and what have you, in the midst of all the difficulty, God can give you peace. He can do that now and he can see you safe to the other side. For every day is Sunday and Sabbath had no end to that mansion that he has for you on the other side. That mansion is signed that Jesus gone to prepare for you. And some say, well, it's not a mansion. It's really a room or boarding place. I don't care what it is. If Jesus prepared it, and it's a mansion because there are no shacks in the city whose streets are paved with gold and whose walls of jasper. So cast your lot with the Lord. Place all of your cares on him. Lean on him. You find that he is a mighty good leaning post. You find that he will come to your rescue. He will hear before you call. And he will answer while you call him. He's God, and he's God all by himself. He has a forgiving heart. He's a loving father, and he is always present. 
You don't have to look for him. He's always present. Just call on him and he will come to your rescue. Well, children, this is the message the Lord has for us today. We trust that he find a hardened place in your heart. That this word, like all of his word, you hide in your heart that you will not sin against him. And that he will bless you in this life and in the life to come. Turn your back on sin, no matter how attractive it is. Because sin offers no lasting benefits, only lasting regrets, only lasting hurt, only lasting damage. Turn to God and let him be your master and your master only. All right, let us pray with you now. Let us close our eyes and prepare for an altar call and altar prayer. Realizing that who we're praying to is the God of the universe. The one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who has all power in his hand. One who knows everything. And one who is everywhere. So no matter where you are today, God is there. Where can you go from the presence of the Lord? The answer is nowhere. You take the wings of the morning and go to some parts of the world, earth. He's there. Make your bed in hell. He's there. The depths of the ocean. He is there. He is everywhere. Cast your lot with God. And you will never be ashamed. Tell God our Father, we come now to recognize you as the supreme being, as the God who is in a category all by yourself. There's none like you, none have ever been, or none now and never will be. You are God all by yourself. And it just amazes, overwhelms us when we realize who you really are, how you're high and lifted up, how you're the creator of the heavens and the earth, yet you're concerned about the least one of us. You cared for the least one of us so much that you sent your only begotten son to die on Calvary that we may have an opportunity to the tree of life. Thank you, Lord. All we can do is bow in humble submission before you and express our gratefulness to you that you covered us long enough while we were in darkness to let light come into our lives so we could turn from our evil ways, cast off sin and sinfulness, Take on Jesus Christ, your son, that we might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And to serve you through him the rest of our life. Thank you for making that possible for each one of us. We know we are not deserving. Oh, but how we thank you that you accepted us with our chips, cracks, and broken places in our lives. We, we bless your name today. We honor you. We magnify you. And Lord, while we are honoring, magnifying, we want to pray for all of those who ask us to pray for them. Those who are going through any kind of affliction. We pray for those who are the leaders of our nation. Pray for preachers everywhere. Pray for churches everywhere who doors stand open in your name. We pray to you for these worldwide concerns. Because you, we know you everywhere. You have all power, all knowledge. And you know how to handle that which you have. We come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we submit this prayer. Jesus, the one who we have confessed to be our Lord, believing in our heart, that you raised him from the dead as a sign you were satisfied with him as being our acceptable sacrifice. And therefore it's safe for us to place our trust in him. And depend on him to get you, get us to you when this life is over. It is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 And God bless you and God keep you. If you wish to give to the Lord through this ministry, you can do it by using the Giblify app. The Corinth Missionary Baptist Church is 2774. County Road 236, Tyler, Texas. Or you can use the, mail it in to that same address, 75705 in Tyler, Texas. God bless you and God keep you. 
So that would be our prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.